um, although it won't be directly tested on the exam. And then I'll do some review and then we'll go over some sample exam questions, which I will post on TWEN um, later this week. And that'll be the end. That'll take us through the end of the semester. And just as a reminder for those of you, I know many of you have sent me your response paper. It's really too too long of a word, too big of a word for it, but your, your response reaction to the um, professionalism lecture. So I'll just need that from everybody um, before the last day of class or on the last day of class or by the end of the last day of class, which is, I believe, um, two weeks from this Wednesday. And then the exam, as you know, as we've talked about in the past, is an eight hour floating take home. Uh, you can take it um, at 12.01 a.m. anytime between 12.01 a.m. on the first day of the exam period through um, 11.59 p.m. on the last day. You have to find an eight hour block to take it. Um, you'll upload it or download it on TWIN and then you'll upload your answers back up on TWIN. Um, I've gotten questions in the past about, well, students in the past have, have wanted to use, if they want to do a handwritten tables, um, again, you can imagine that, you know, at least one of the questions will be construct a balance sheet. So some folks can do it, you know, in Word. Um, that's great, more power to you. Um, if you, I can't, if, I can't very easily. If you want to handwrite tables, you'll have the uh, ability to upload uh, two documents. So your written explanation and your um, and your uh, your your uh, tables in that case. Okay. So any questions about the rest of the semester or the exam? Um, it's not intended to be eight hours of frenetic working, uh, I sort of structure it so that it could be a, an in-class exam. It'd be kind of challenging to be an in-class exam, a four-hour in-class exam. It could be doable. Um, um, so, but you'll have more time. Again, if you're doing it right, um, it shouldn't be frenetic. You should have time to figure out your answers, construct, uh, think about how you're going to present them, you know, and have time to proofread it and, and the like. Um, now, the only way that doesn't really work out is sometimes if you go down a wrong avenue too far, you know, it could, you could be scrambling to get back. Um, but again, it's not designed to be eight hours. It's designed to really be like four hours. Any questions about any of that? Now's a good time. I like taking questions about the exam, in particular in class, so everyone has the same opportunity to hear the same information. So if you want to email me questions, I can, I'll answer them either in a group email or, a, or in the next class session. Um, okay, well, hearing none, um, let's move on. So today we are talking about uh, the disguised sale rule. So remember the rules that we have, especially with regard to cash distributions are pretty easy. If we receive a cash distribution as a partner, that cash distribution is tax-free to the extent we have basis in the partnership interest. Um, and we have basis in the partnership interest if we've contributed property or cash that has basis. We have basis in the partnership interest if we have a share of the partnership debt, under 72. We have partnership outside basis if we have been allocated income. It's not yet been distributed. It's all sorts of ways we can have basis in the partnership interest. But the key is that the first dollars out sort of eat up that basis. Um, and that's somewhat unique in the tax system. Um, let's compare to a situation where let's say I sell, I buy a tract of land for a hundred and then I sell 60% of the land for some amount. Well, the question is, and I'm gonna say all this cash, so I've got cash and I'm gonna have gain, except to the extent I have basis uh, in the property that I sold. Can I take the position that 
all 100 of my basis in the land goes to the harsh portion of the land that I sold? And the answer is no, we can't do that. We prorate basis. We apportion basis between the kept portion and the sold portion. So in my example, if I sold 60% of the land, 60% of my basis will go with it. Um, so that's somewhat different than the way we deal with partnership with cash and sort of first dollar eats up basis until we have no more basis and then we have gain. That's not the way it works when we sell property. And that distinction and how we use basis provides an opportunity for abuse in the partnership context. So if I want to sell my property partially, I could try to contribute it to a partnership, have the partnership then distribute cash to me in a related transaction. And then I get to use each dollar of basis on a dollar for dollar basis before I have gain, which is different than if I had sold that property. So let me just use a simple example, pull up the whiteboard. You guys can see the white porn. Okay. Um, so let's say I uh, A has property with a fair market value of 100 basis of 60. And what's going to happen here is that um, and B is going to B has a has 50 of cash. And what they decide to do is they're going to put the cash of the property together. Um, but A is going to get the cash um, and A and B are each going to be 50% partners in this partnership. Um, so there are two ways you can get this done. One is A can sell to B 50%, sells half of the property to B for 50. In that case, A has an amount realized of 50. Since it's half the property is being sold, half the basis comes with it. So this is a, just a basis is 30. He has 20 of gain. So A would have 20 of gain. And then A and B then contribute their respective one half portions to the partnership. They just drop, drop it down. So A contributes his retained half of the property with a fair market value of 50 and a basis of 60, basis of 30. So A's outside basis would be 30. B, having just purchased half the property for cash, B's basis in half the land is 50. B's outside basis would be 50. And the partnership takes an inside basis of A's half is 30, B's half is 50, of inside basis of 80. And it has a book value, fair market value of 100. So this all makes sense. There's 40 of built-in gain in the property. A is recognizing 20 right away. And A has 704C gain 
with the remaining 20. So if we sold it, half the property to B, and then each party contributed it, that would be the result. Any questions on that? That makes sense? And alternatively, we could have A contribute the entire property, 100% of the property, to the partnership, and B contributes cash. And then in step two, the partnership distributes the cash. Okay. Well, if this transaction were respected as a contribution and distribution, then A would take an outside basis of 60 because he's contributing the whole property. B would take an outside basis of 50, even B had an outside basis of 50. And then when the partnership distributes the cash to A, that's a cash distribution of 50 to A, who has an outside basis of 60, A would have no gain because there's no cash distribution in excess of basis. So A would have zero gain. And A's outside basis would be 10. and the partnership's inside basis would be 60. So we see the differences and the big difference here is gonna be this gain here. We did a sale, a partial sale. A recognized the gain right away. When we do a contribution distribution, if it's respected, A recognizes no gain. In a partial sale, A has 20 of 704C gain In a contribution distribution, A has 40 of 704C gain because the inside basis will be 60 and the fair market value is 100. So it's deferral, right? We've now gotten cash out of this land for, for A and A didn't have to pay any gain. He got to use, again, his basis sort of in full to absorb the cash here, but here, he only got to use a proportional amount of the basis to absorb the cash. And the result again is going to be deferral. How long is a deferral of that 20 gain? It depends how long that partnership holds that land or A holds his partnership interest. It'll be eliminated, it'll end, I guess, when the partnership sells the land or when A sells his partnership interest. The time value of money means that's a good, you know, that's deferral is good for all gain is good. And again, A, A could die, uh, in which case A would get a stepped up basis in his partnership interest. So it would eliminate that low basis. And if a 754 election were in effect, we didn't deal, we didn't do 754 in the context of death of a partner. But when A's heirs get the stepped up basis, if there's a 754 election in effect, that's going to step up the basis give the A's heirs a special basis adjustment in the land. Long, long story short, if A dies, um, that built-in gain may very well uh, be eliminated. But if he dies before the partnership sells the land and before A sells his partnership interest. So we got the furl in door number two and the potential, potentially with section 1014 stepped up basis, uh, complete elimination of gain. And that's the problem that set the disguise sale rule was designed to deal with. And to sort of say, well, do we really have a contribution and a distribution or is it really economically just a sale? Uh, they're very similar transactions, at least formally, right? Um, but we have to try to distinguish between that. And the key, what the regs try to do is they try to say, look, partners are subject to the entrepreneurial risks of the partnership. 
Uh, when you're a partner, you may get distributions, you may not. And what that depends on, what that risk is, is the risk of the venture. If the venture does well, you get rich. If the venture does poorly, you lose your money. If you're going to get a distribution that's immune from the entrepreneurial risk, that starts to look a lot like, yeah, you sold part of the property to your partners, to the partnership. Okay, that's background. Any questions on that background? It's really just designed to show you why, what's at stake here. What's the difference? We have another opportunity in the problem set to do something like this again. All right, well, let's look at the code sections. Let's turn to section 701, sorry, sorry, 707 of the code. It's a code section we haven't seen before. So one thing to start is let's look at 707A1. 707A1 says if a partner engages in a transaction with a partnership other than in a capacity of, as a member of the partnership, the transaction shall, except to those provided, be considered as occurring between the partnership and one who is not a partner. That's a mouthful. It's a long-winded way of saying that partners, in general, can transact with their partnerships as non-partners. So you can sell property to your partnership. You can rent property to your partnership. You can buy property from your partnership and you can rent property from your partnership and you can do that and it'll be treated as an arm's length transaction. And you might say, well, duh, like, of course, right? I mean, it's actually a pretty interesting question and it gets back to this aggregate versus entity theory. If the partnership is an entity, separate entity for tax purposes, then of course you can rent property from somebody else. But if it's an aggregate, it's treated as an aggregate, you can't rent property to yourself. Like you're not going to, if you own property in an LLC, single member LLC, it's disregarded as an entity and you uh, rent property from that LLC. The tax, the tax law is not going to see the LLC as having rental income and you having a rental deduction. You can't rent property yourself. You can't employ yourself. You can't sell yourself property. I guess the, the, the better example would be, what if you sold property or single member LLC? Let's say you wanted to recognize gain uh, because you had a capital loss if you're a corporation that's expiring. So you want to recognize gain. So you can use this capital loss and give your basis, step up your basis, sort of free basis, because you're going you know, to use a capital loss. You might say, oh, I'll sell it to my single member LLC. That doesn't work. Tax law is going to say, you didn't sell property yourself. You just moved property from one of your pockets to another pocket, and you moved cash from one of your pockets to another pocket. Like That's not a sale. So, but this is saying, at least in this regard, the entity theory controls that you can, in fact, rent property to a partnership in which you're a partner. So if you just sell property or partnership, that's just a sale. Um, now, there are rules, by the way, if you sell property to your partnership at a loss, so you, you have a built-in loss property and you sell it to your partnership, there's a separate rule which we're not going to cover section 267 that says in, when you sell property to a related party that the loss may be disallowed. Um, and there's definition of relationship including partnerships, partners that are considered related to partnerships. Um, that's the tax law trying to get at this problem that, okay, what if you do sell to a separate entity but they're related enough to you that it's kind of like moving property from your one pocket to another. And that shouldn't be the occasion for recognizing a loss. It'd be too easy to sort of trigger your losses by moving your property sort of around from one pocket to another. So 267 could deny that loss deduction, but that's the same. It's not because it's a partner or partnership transaction. It's because it's a related party transaction that 267 applies to. So that's 707A1, and that's not really what we're dealing with here because what we're dealing with here is a purported contribution by a partner of property and then a distribution of cash to that partner. And 
So that's covered by 707A2 cap B. This is the disguised sale rule, 707A2 cap B. And the code is very um, vague, I guess is the right word. There's a lot of words where if you were left with the code, you would say, well, what, what the heck does that mean? We have these three requirements in A to B. We have to meet all of them because of that word, and. So if we have a direct or indirect transfer of money or property by a partner to a partnership, and generally we're gonna be focusing on property, other property other than money. And then there is a related, that's one catch word. What does related mean? There's a related direct or indirect transfer of money or other property, and we're gonna focus on the part of transferring money by the partnership to such partner. That's So one little I is your contribution of property by the partner. Two little I's is your related distribution of money by the partnership. And then the last thing is that the transfers described in one and two when viewed together are properly characterized as a sale or exchange. So that's another term that really is not apparent what it means, properly characterized as a sale or exchange. It's kind of the, the idea of a sub, you know, substance over form, substantively treated as a, uh, to be characterized as a sale or exchange, then such transfers shall be treated as a transaction described in paragraph one. What that means is that it's, uh, as a sale or exchange between the partnership and the partner. And this last clause is that you can get into situations where it could be treated as if you have um, contributions of, uh, let's say partner A contributes property, and partner B contributes property, and A's property goes to B and B's property goes to A, you can, that could be re-characterized as just an exchange between the two partners. So, that last clause deals with that situation. We're not gonna really have to worry about that. We're gonna focus on the typical consequences just to recharacterize it as a transaction between non-partner, non-partnership as an arm's length transaction, which means a sale. So in our, in the whiteboard, if the rule applies, the transaction that was all the way on the right hand side would be recharacterized and taxed as the transaction on the left hand side. What is purported a contribution distribution transaction or set of transactions is instead treated as a part sale, part contribution of property. Okay, any questions on the code? So again, this doesn't, this doesn't have a lot of flesh on the bones. You'd be hard pressed to sort of figure out what this means by itself. I mean, you have some legislative history, uh, but luckily Treasury wrote a bunch of regs. So let's turn to those regs, 1.707-3. These will be referred to as the dash three regs. And it goes on by just talking, you know, in more plain English, what's going on. If you have a transaction that's covered, uh, then the transfers are treated as a sale of property in whole or in part to the partnership. I'm going to recharacterize the purported contribution and distribution as just a sale. Now things get complicated. Um, if the property is contributed on day one and the distribution occurs, let's say a year later, we've got something else going on and it's treated as a sale. Uh, we've got a, uh, a deferred sale. We've got a situation where you're selling property on day one, but you're not receiving the proceeds until day 366. 
and the tax law imputes interest in that consequence. And so if you don't have simultaneous contribution distribution, you're going to have a sort of a time value money adjustment as well. So you'll have a sale and also a loan um, because you're delaying receiving your cash, you effectively made a loan to the partnership as well. So you'll recognize gain and interest income and the partnership will have a cost basis in the property that it deemed purchased and it'll have an interest deduction. So, and we, I obviously can't test you on those time value money rules. They're technical and require some financial expertise and we're not covering them here, but just know uh, we're going to deal with simultaneous exchanges or, or I tell you to ignore that piece of it if I were to have a fact pattern like that. But in the real world, we do have that separate issue of um, where we have non-simultaneous property uh, contributions and distributions that are captured by this rule. You've also got an interest element in there. Um, and so the rule here is in dash 3B. So 3B helps flesh out the statutory um, directive here. That word related, that word properly characterized, that term properly characterized, it helps. Uh, so in B1, so the transfer of property by a partner to a partnership and the transfer of money as your contribution of property and distribution of money by the partnership constitute a sale of property by the partner to the partnership only if based on the facts and circumstances we have these two conditions. Condition one, the transfer of money, the distribution would not have been made but for the transfer of property. That's a but for uh, causation, right? Going back to like torts class, right? If the property contribution has not been made, would the transfer of money have been made? That's pretty easy, generally easier to figure out. And usually the answer is no, the transfer of money would not have been made, but for the transfer of property, the contribution was important. That's one of the reasons why the partners are getting paid, why the partners getting paid. Uh, the second condition is more fraught and it says in cases in which the transfers are not made simultaneously, the subsequent transfer, which is here the distribution of money, is not dependent on entrepreneurial risks of partnership operations. So that gets to the question again, is your, is your distribution subject to partnership risk, like risk of being a partner? If you're guaranteed to get that second distribution, that doesn't sound like you're, uh, you're being a partner in a partnership, you're acting as a partner in a partnership. If on the other hand, you only get that distribution, if things go well, then you're acting as a partner. It gets harder once the entrepreneurial risk is reduced. What if you get that second distribution if things don't go poorly? That sounds like that's entrepreneurial risk. What if you don't get, what if you uh, only get that second distribution if things don't go exceptionally poorly? You know, now you're starting to look not like you're subject to entrepreneurial risk. So again, we've got some meat on the bones. It doesn't help much though in real life, again, because you can imagine fact patterns where this is really hard to figure out what, how to apply it. And you have B2, we've got a list of factors that are relevant. And, but this is also unhelpful or not very helpful, uh, you know, there will, the weight to be given depends on the fact particular case. That's code for, we don't have any idea how these, how these facts are going to be weighed. Um, and there are other facts. These are not the exclusive set of facts. So it's just your old facts and circumstances test. What Scalia used to rail against because it provides no guidance because who knows what the IRS is going to think are relevant facts and circumstances and how to weight them. And then who knows what the tax court judge and the circuit court judge and the Supreme Court judge, what are they going to say? How are they going to do that? So intellectually, this all makes sense. The problem is practically, it's really a big problem. 
And the reg writers knew this, that this uncertainty is very significant. So the reg writers put in some very significant presumptions that do a lot of the work here. And um, we've got dash 3C um, and it says, for purposes of this section, if within a two year period, a partner transfers property to a partnership and the partnership transfers money, without regard to the order, the distribution could come first. But if we have a two year window where we have contribution of property by a partner and distribution of money back to that partner, and the transfers are presumed to be a sale of the property, unless the fact and circumstances is clearly established otherwise. So that's your two year presumption. So if I contribute property on day one and on day 731, I receive a cash distribution that's outside this presumption. But if I get cash on day 729, now it is subject to this presumption and I would have to establish, um, clearly establish that's not a sale. And then the backstop that we have disclosure requirements that if you have this tr contribution distribution uh, within two years that we generally have to disclose it to the IRS if we're treating it as not a sale. There's some other exceptions we're gonna get to in a second. Doesn't mean we're dead, just means we're, you know, if I do it on day 729, that means I'm gonna to have to disclose it to the government and say, I'm not treating this as it's got a sale and here's why. And if the IRS were to challenge me, I would have to clearly establish that I'm right. Not just established, right? Normally I'd have to establish you know, by a 50.1% chance, right? And I have to clearly establish something higher than that. And then the, it, re, 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 um, um, the other way, if we have now D, the reverse is true. If we have transfers of contributions and then distributions that are more than two years apart, then the transfers are presumed not to be a sale unless the facts and circumstances clearly establish that they are a sale. Okay, so two years, we're gonna see with mixing bowl, seven years is a big term, big length of time, period of time that's important for the uh, sky sales, two years is a big factor. Any questions on that? Okay, so the reg writers also realized that certain distributions of cash are not um, appropriately considered sales proceeds. And so they created these safe harbors and said, if your distribution of cash is covered by one of these three safe harbors, then it's not a disguised sale and you don't have to disclose it. Um, and so one is considered a reasonable guaranteed payment. So it's very common that when a partner contributes capital, so you have, you, have, you have a partnership where you have a capital provider and a and service providers. On the typical deal, for whatever reason, it's interesting sociologically to think about, but the typical deal is that the money person, I'm using money to refer to capital, that the money person gets a preferred, gets a guaranteed payment or preferred return. Um, and what a guaranteed payment is just kind of like interest. Uh, it means you're going to get paid interest on your um, property that you're contributing. And that's gonna distinguish you from service providers who don't get interest on their 
services. Now, maybe the one way to think about it is that guaranteed payment is, is akin to like your salary. If you're a service provider, you will often get some um, distribution that's going to be a salary. So you'll get guaranteed payment for services. We're going to talk a little bit about that stuff later on. So these are guaranteed payments for capital. And the key here is that the sort of the interest rate that you get just has to be a reasonable amount. And there's some um, there's a calculation based on your applicable federal rate, safe harbor interest rate, 150% of the highest applicable federal rate. And so once you have a guaranteed uh, payment for capital, it doesn't exceed the safe harbor rate. Now those distributions, which are guaranteed payments for capital, are not going to be treated as distributions that are eligible to be recharacterized as sales. And we have a, a very related concept, which is preferred return. And so the distinction between a guaranteed payment and a preferred return is pretty subtle. Guaranteed payment is guaranteed. Um, you get it. It's not conditioned on the partnership making money. It's like a sort of a lender that you can't say to your lender, sorry, I can't pay your interest this month because I didn't earn any money this month. Um, where a preferred return says, All right, we're going to give you uh, your share of the income first. You get your share of the income off the top to a certain extent. And then the rest will be shared um, you know, with the service partners. So you might have preferred return. It says you get an 8% preferred return. So you contribute $100 of property. You get $8 of income allocated to you first before we share with the service partner. It should be 50-50. So again, I put in 100. My partner is a service partner, puts in zero. I negotiate for a preferred return of 8%. That'll say that I get the first $8 of income and a related cash distribution of the $8 before we start sharing the rest 50-50. If it was a guaranteed payment, I get that 8% no matter what happens. Even if we lose money, I get it. And one question to me, where's that money going to come from if we don't have any income? But that's a separate issue. Um, and so the preferred return, if it turns out we don't, I don't get, I don't have, we don't earn enough to fill the 8%, I don't get 8% of preferred return. I have no legal entitlement to that full amount. I get it to the extent it's there. And likewise, preferred returns, to the extent they're within the safe harbor, have to be a reasonable rate. Um, then the cash distribution with respect to a preferred return is not subject to recharacterization as a disguise sale. So typically, these will be these safe harbors will be built into the partnership agreement, and your rate will be um, within the safe harbor rate. So you don't have to avoid any, you don't have to worry about any of these problems. Now, just because you're at, and if you're excess of the safe harbor rate doesn't mean you're dead in the water. It just means that excess now is going to be disclosable because it's within two years. And now the burden is going to show that, hey, this high guarantee payment and high reason, high preferred return was not part of a sale, you know, that was subject to entrepreneurial risks. Uh, and such. Okay, any questions on those two safe harbor sort of exceptions? The last one deals with operating cash flow distributions. So an operating cash flow distribution is also is also presumed not to be part of a sale. And operating cash flow just means, so now you have, let's say you have a, a real estate business, your operating cash flow is gonna be your rents that you receive, less your operating expenses, maintenance, insurance, um, salaries, and that excess is gonna be your 
operating cash flow and you can distribute that to your partners and not have to worry about the disguised sale rule. And again, there's some technical definitions that are usually picked up in partnership agreements to make sure that you're within the safe harbor and then you don't have to worry about disclosure and getting your transaction recast. And again, you would think operating cash flow, that sounds like substantial operational risk, right? I mean, operating cash flow distributions, if you don't have operating cash flow, so if your tenants all stop paying, then you're not going to have operating cash flow. That's entrepreneurial risk. So it seems like it's redundant of the rule, but again, it avoids two things, disclosure, well, three things. It avoids you having to analyze that question. It avoids then disclosure and avoids you having to fight the IRS against the presumption. So it's very useful. Okay, any questions? So I'm not gonna test you on these exemptions. I mean, you should know they exist. Uh, you should understand in general what a guaranteed payment for capital is, what a preferred return is, and what operating cash flow distributions are, but just very generally. Um, and you should know that they are exempted from the disguised sale. I mean, technically they're not. Technically they're, they're they're uh, presumed not to be part of a sale unless, uh, unless we're clearly rebutted. But as a practical matter, they're not, they're never clearly rebutted. So as a practical matter, they are exempted. Okay, any questions on those? All right, the last thing we have to deal with is debt. What if you contribute property that's subject to a debt? And we know that in the tax law, going back to basic tax course, that when someone assumes your debt, in a, a lot of ways, that's like someone giving you cash because you no longer have to pay the debt. And in some ways, it could be very much like cash. Like what if you borrow on day one against the property, then on day two, someone else takes the property subject to the debt. Kind of looks like you cashed out. Um, and so we have to deal with that. And the dash five reg deals with that and it creates this concept of qualified liability. So if you have a qualified liability that's assumed by the partnership, then you get to ignore it. It's not treated as a distribution of money for this purpose. It's still a distribution under 72B. It's still gonna reduce your outside basis, um, but it's not treated as a distribution of money that's gonna trigger this guy's sale so what are so it's very important that your liabilities there soon be a qualified liability. Otherwise, you have to worry about the sky sale rule. And what's the definition of a qualified liability? What's defined in uh, dash five a six with the heading helpful heading qualified liability partner defined. And we have a list of qualified liabilities. And the first one, six one, six one the lie cap A is an important one. And it says if the liability was incurred by the partner more than two years prior to the contribution and has encumbered the transfer property throughout that two year period. So there's your old and cold liability more than two years before you contributed or before you agree to contribute it, then your liability is ignored. Second one is a liability that was not incurred in anticipation of the transfer, but was within the two years. So if it's within two years, then your question is gonna be, did you incur it in anticipation of the transfer to the partnership. And we have a presumption down here that is generally presumed to be anticipation within the two year, unless clearly established otherwise. So again, two years becomes very important.
So if your fact pattern says, you know, you're li- you know, that there was a liability that was incurred more than two years before, then you're good. At least you don't have to worry about the sky sale rule. Within two years, now you got to prove it wasn't anticipation. Otherwise, you're in the, the sky sale rule. Um, you also have a disclosure. So you have the presumption, you have the disclosure requirement down here within two years. What about another one that, that is helpful within two years? Again, so if you're outside of two years, you don't have to worry, you're done. If it's within two years, it's going to be okay if, if it's a if the liability is allocable to a capital expenditure. So if you used the liability to improve the property, let's say I, I borrow, let's say on day one, I borrow money to improve the property, to build the property, build a structure, improve the property. And then on day 366, one year later, I contribute the property subject to the debt. That's going to be okay because of this one in cap C. That makes sense. I'm not cashing out. Uh, We're really looking for situations where I take the cash and go do stuff with it. Here, I'm borrowing money, but I'm putting it right back into the property. So it doesn't look like a disguised sale. When I do that, I haven't cashed out. Another liability within two years that you don't have to worry about is a liability incurred in the ordinary course of a trader business where you're transferring the entire trader business to the partnership. So those are the big ones. And again, I think the biggest ones are given two more than two years out, the two year rule, the old and cold rule and the capital expenditure rule. And once you have a qualified liability, again, you don't treat that that um, assumption of the liability as a distribution for purposes of 707A2 cap B. Okay, but then if you have a non-qualified liability, liability that's not a qualified liability, now you have a distribution that's treated as, so this is by contrast, if the partnership assumes or takes property so to a liability, other than a qualified liability, the partnership is treated as transfer consideration to the partner to the extent the amount of liability exceeds the partner's share of that liability. So we're gonna look and see how much of that liability comes back to you under 72. To the extent you're shedding liability here, then that's going to be treated as a distribution for versus 707A2 cap B. So let's take a simple example. Let's say I have property, I, I borrow it, I, I, I borrow against it. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I contribute it to a partnership. The partnership assumes the debt and it's a recourse debt and the economic risk of loss is borne by the general partner. Now I'm a limited partner. Well, in that case, the part of the liability is non-record, not a non-qualified, because it was more than two years, less than two years. And I didn't use the property, use the cash to improve, improve the property. And then I'm not going to get any liability back because it's a recourse liability and I'm a limited partner. It's going to go to the general partner. So it'll be treated as a distribution of money to me in the entire amount. And that would be the sky sale. To the extent some of that, let's, get, let's say all the liability comes back to me. So let's say I contribute it, I'm the sole general partner and it's a recourse liability. Well, then I won't have any distribution here because even though it's a non-qualified liability, I'm getting it all back under 752. And then there are rules, I'm not going to get into the details, there are rules that actually allow you, you can contribute property on day one 
and then to the partnership and then the partnership could then borrow against that property and then distribute cash to me out of that borrowing. It's called a leverage distribution. And there are rules that if that's done within two years, that's that distribution of the borrowing proceeds, that again, the same thing, it, that becomes a disguised sale, but only to the extent uh, the liabilities incurred by the partnership is in excess of my share of that liability. So a lot of the games that were played, and you saw this with the Wisco case and the materials, historically have been to try to get liabilities to technically come back to the contributor under 72, because it's a very technical rule. Remember, we're economic risk of loss, and we don't really care whether people are, are actually going to be able to pay the debt or not. Uh, but that got, that got abused. Um, and so you had situations using like bottom dollar guarantees where they were trying to get large chunks of the liability back to the contributor under 72, where economically they weren't really exposed to that liability. And so the rules under 72 have been tweaked under 707 in ways, and we're, we don't have to get into the details, but there are sort of special 72 sharing rules under for purposes of disguised sale that are different than the general rules we learned. Uh, this became a really popular technique if you had a highly appreciated property and you found the buyer, what you you found the buyer, you would instead of selling them the property, you would form a partnership with the bar with the buyer and effectively have the buyer assume the debt, even though technically the debt was treated as a lot of it was yours. And so the IRS has taken pains to sort of tamp down on that abuse. Again, pretty far beyond where we need to go, but you should know that, the, that it's out there. But I, I really want you, particularly for the exam, to just be able to, to have, see where you have a qualified liability. Okay, old and cold liability uh, qualified, uh, as well as liabilities that incurred to improve the property are qualified liabilities. All right, questions on any of that? Okay, well, let's go to the problem set. We just have three problems. This is on page 300 or so. We've got problem 3A, uh, B, and C. We've got a fact pattern here. Um, and it's, it's really good problem to sort of show the stakes. And so here we've got A um, who has an outside basis of 30. And A has equipment with a fair market value of 20 an adjusted basis of one. So highly appreciated equipment, likely because it's been depreciated and its basis is almost zero. It's almost fully depreciated. And the partnership earns $60,000 of net income during the year. And um, so 15,000 of that would go to A, who's a 25% partner. But in A, we just have a sale, a straight sale. Um, so if A just sells the property to the partnership, that's 707A1. You can sell property to partnership. You can engage in the uh, transaction with the partnership as a non-partner. That's what A is doing. So we're just into like the general rules. So the amount realized is 20. A's adjusted basis is one and A would have 19 gain. So A has 19 of gain. The partnership takes a 1012, section 1012 cost basis of 20. 
So A's got the 20 of cash. Partnership has the equipment. Partnership's got a basis of 20. A has a gain of 19. A will also have that 15,000 of flow through income as well. And by the way, that 15,000 of flow through income is kind of a red herring um, here. I'm not sure why it's in the fact pattern, frankly. Um, okay, questions on A. So that's our sale. And so you can imagine when this happens, A says, wait, I don't want to, I don't want 19 of gain. It's or, you know, again, if it's depreciation recapture, if you purchase the equipment for 20 or more, that's all 19 of ordinary income under section 1245. And so A says, I don't want a whole bunch of ordinary income. Can we structure it differently? And so the lawyer, her, A's lawyer says, yeah, you know, A's lawyer is smart enough. They, A knows, A's lawyer is smart enough. They know the general rules of partnership distributions, but they don't know the disguise sale rule apparently. So they tell her to do what's in B. Um, and in B, um, a contributes the equipment and then later that year receives a distribution of 20. So you have a contribution and then a distribution. I'm not sure why it says a capital account's not increased. Your capital account would go up, her capital account would go up by 20, the fair market value. It's gonna go down by 20 when she gets the distribution. At least that's the form. So if the form was respected, so let's assume that the sky sale rule isn't triggered, which it is, but let's assume it isn't. Um, A's outside basis is 30 to start, and then it goes up by one. That's under section 722. That's the one of basis he has in the equipment. It goes up by one, and then it would go down by 20. That's the distribution of money. Just basic equipment. This is the money distributed. And so his outside basis at the end would be 11. The partnership's basis in the property and equipment would be one. And we'd have that 19 of built in gain. That would be A's built in gain under 704C. But the big difference here is no gain. A has no gain. Again, just if we have a contribution and distribution that's not subject to 707A2 cap B. So, but that's if 707A2 cap B didn't apply, but it does apply, at least we have to analyze it. And so we got real problems here. And practically we're gonna say, we, a big problem is gonna be, we have a distribution within two years of money. A contributed property on day one, within two years of that, A received a distribution of money at 20. So we have a few outs for A. Is it a guaranteed payment for capital? Reasonable guarantee payment for capital. Is it a uh, preferred return, reasonable preferred return? Is it an operating cash flow distribution? Doesn't seem like it. There are no facts to indicate that it's one of those three. Then we get into related. Is, it, are the, is the distribution related to the property contribution? I mean, again, there could be facts that say that this distribution was gonna happen regardless of whether A contributed the property, right? Let's say it was in the partnership agreement before A contributes the property. So you could win on unrelated, you need to, you need to know more facts. And, this, and even if it's related, then it has to, is the second distribution so it's an entrepreneurial risk of the partnership. And the burden would be on A to show that 
to establish that clearly to get out of it. And just there are no facts that would indicate uh, that she would be able to do so. And so if it is, assuming she can't, then it's recharacterized as a sale and her amount realized is we're back to sort of A. So it's back to A. A would have 19 of gain. Now one caveat, because these are not simultaneous distributions, it says later in the year, that actually some of that gain is going to be re, going to be interest income because she's receiving it not in day one, but down the road. And so the gain will be a little bit less than 19, and the difference will re represent interest income to A. And flip side for partnership, partnership basis will be a little bit less than 19. And the partnership will also have an interest deduction of the difference. So, but it, leaving aside the interest stuff and interest rates are pretty low now. So we, you know, we can kind of ignore it now. Um, B it turns into A under 707A2 cap B unless A can rebut can, with clear, uh, can clearly establish a rebuttal to the presumption. Okay, so that's B. So again, you're sort of your lawyer smart enough to know that the distribution rules on their face work pretty well, but then not smart enough to realize that 7782 cap B is a real problem. Okay, in C, C just is an example where in A, in, in A and B, uh, A is selling the entire amount of the property. In C, now the distribution is only 15. Um, so again, the form, if we respect the form, that distribution of cash would be tax-free and his outside basis is going to be 16. We have the same, oh, um, we have the same issue, issues about whether this is a sky sale. So the threshold issue is going to be, is this a sky sale? So to come back to the same stuff we talked about, do we have any, the safe harbors cover it? Um, can we clearly rebut? The presumption, again, there's no facts to indicate that we can. So this is a disguised sale. And the only trick here is that when the distribution of money is not equal to the value of the property, we treat it as a part sale, part contribution. So in B, we recharacterize it as just a plain old sale. In C, we're going to treat it as a part sale, part contribution. So we have... Um, our sale and we have our contribution. We're going to recharacterize it in the sale. The amount realized is 15 and the adjusted basis of the sale portion, since we're selling 15 of property worth 20, we're selling 75% of the property. This is 15 over 20. And the remaining amount a is contributing, that's five over 20. So that means A's basis in the property that's being sold is 75% of the entire basis. So that's gonna be 0.75. So A is gonna have 14.25 of gain. And then he's contributing the remaining portion is a fair market value of five an adjusted basis of 0.25. And so A would have no gain on that portion. The partnership's basis partnership's inside basis is going to be 15 for this portion. It's cost basis. Partnership is buying that portion. 
n is going to be 0.25 for this portion. This is section 1012. This is section 723. So the entirety of the basis in the property is going to be 15.25. So the bottom line here is A is going to have this 14.25 of gain right away. The partnership is going to have a basis of 15.25 in the property that has a fair market value of 20. So that's that 4.75 built in gain. And that's going to be A's 4.75 of built in gain under 704C because that's the gain that A is not recognizing here. So again, it's, just, it's the same conceptual situation in B. In B, A is just selling the entire property because A is getting a distribution equal to the fair market value that's recharacterized as sales proceeds. In C, A is not getting the full value and distribution, A is getting something somewhat less. And so now we just have to, um, we have a part sale, part contribution. Whereas in B, we had just a sale. And we have a part sale, part contribution. The key is we just have to apportion the basis between the sale portion and the contribution portion. And that's done pro rata based on their respective fair market values. So would A's outside basis be 20 then? So A's outside basis now, yep, so let's do that. So A's outside basis would be 30 plus 0.25. So because starts at 30 and this part has no effect on outside basis. This is just the sale. So this part increases outside basis by set uh, under section 722. And that all makes sense. His basis, if we respected the form, his outside basis would be 16 and he would not be taxed at all currently. Now, He's taxed on 14.25, and so his outside basis is at 16 plus the 14.25, which is 30.25. So it makes sense. But yeah, once you have a sale, once you characterize something as a sale under 707A2KFB, it's just a sale. Um, if you still have a contribution, once you're done with that, then that contribution is just treated like a contribution as we've learned it. Um, no gain or loss recognized. Um, carry over basis to the property, you add the basis of the property to the partner's outside basis. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so again, think about this as just an exception to the general rule of, uh, that we learned about distributions. And we're gonna see another exception, a set of exceptions on Wednesday. Um, dealing with 707, we're dealing with, the, with um, related to 704C. So it's another good opportunity to review 704C. And basically the preview is 704C works pretty well when the 704C property stays in the partnership. But what happens if A contributes property that has 704C built in gain, and then that property is distributed to B? One of the general rules, that's not gonna result in a gain to anybody. Um, and that 704C property is, has flown the coop, if you will. And absent some special rule, it's gonna break down 704C. We have to have that, that relationship between 
the contributing partner and the property. Once that relationship is broken because the property has now gone out of the partnership to another partner in a tax free distribution, 704C breaks down. So those are the mixing bowls, what kind of properties going in by one person and out to another person um, creates some problems under 704C, which require some um, exceptions to these general rules that we've learned already. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll see everybody on uh, Wednesday, unless I see you this afternoon at noon for this um, business law uh, preview of courses. So see everybody. Bye-bye.